As classical tarot readers, we begin our craft by inheriting a body of knowledge and wisdom accrued through the ages by renowned occultists who transformed tarot from an entertaining card game for the nobles to an indispensable tool for exercising intuition, for divination, and for connecting to your higher self or higher consciousness. When we honor legacy, we learn facets of tarot symbolism we might not have arrived at on our own. The fool, we are told, carries with him the tools of the magician. The Wheel of Fortune depicts the four fixed signs of the Western Zodiac, the signs symbolic of the four seasons, four elements, four directions, and also that of the divine order. Speaking of the divine, we've got the four Hebrew letters YHVH for Yahweh, God, inscribed into the wheel. Temperance is the time card. The name of the angel is time. Who is that pictured on the world card? Is it relevant that masters of old tell us that the person featured is the hermaphrodite? And there we have symbolism for the four fixed zodiac signs again. How might background knowledge of hermetic symbolism inform the way you read the cards? Leaves from the Kabbalistic Tree of Life are a recurring imagery in the Rider Waite Smith Tarot, the deck my book focuses on. Here I'm only showing four examples. Sift through your cards to see if you can spot them all. Leaves from the Tree of Life are for the healing of nations. The leaves collect strength. How might that inform the omens prognosticated by cards that show up in a reading featuring these leaves? Here are the tombstones of royalty and the religiously pious from medieval Europe. They're exhibited at the Louvre in Paris. The symbolism here connects with the imagery on the Four of Swords. My appreciation for the card's undertone of seeking faith despite overtones of physical challenges gives me much more to draw on as a tarot reader. By the way, fun fact, in 1911, around the time this tarot deck was published, its artist, Pamela Coleman Smith, converted to Catholicism. Knowing historic and cultural context gives me, the tarot reader, a much stronger, more powerful connection with the collective consciousness to the metaphysical compendium of space-time. In the mundane physical world, education advances innovation. It's the same in the metaphysical and spirit world. Education advances your ability to operate esoteric technologies. The more you know about history, the cultural context for the tarot deck you're working with, science, religious mythos, human psychology, and the hierarchies of spirit realms, the more patterns and divine omens you can spot in the cards. Every single form of divination is about spotting patterns and knowing how to interpret those patterns. I can teach you how to spot patterns, but the knowing part comes from wisdom and experience. For instance, let's spot the four horsemen of the apocalypse among the four knights in tarot. The knight of swords rides a white horse and he is conquest, victory, pestilence. The knight of wands rides a red horse and he is war, slaughter, sacrifice. The Knight of Pentacles rides a black horse and he is famine, oppression. The Knight of Cups rides a pale horse and he is death. Does the Knight of Cups remind you a bit of another horseman, say Key 13, the death card? 13, 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 horsemen. Sorry, never mind. Back to tarot. Do you need to be a history buff to read tarot competently? No. When you walk into the Louvre for the National Gallery or the Metropolitan Museum, you don't need a degree in art history to appreciate the masterpieces, but just a little background on those works of art can take you to new depths of appreciation. In John Waterhouse's 1902 painting, The Crystal Ball, the original work features a skull. However, when the painting was sold, its owner was unnerved by the skull, so had another painter paint over that skull to conceal it within the blue curtain. Calling upon a common theme from the pre-Raphaelite era, Waterhouse depicts a woman in an enclosed space, physically able to see the world only through a small window, but that doesn't limit her experiences as we see from her crystal ball gazing, presumably able to see all of the world through scrying and her psychic connections. We also see what appears to be a grimoire and magician's wand before her. The dark trees in the background suggests a sinister or supernatural tone. But if you didn't know the origins of the painting and looked upon the revised work without the skull, that sinister or supernatural tone might not have been as apparent. With the skull, now the complete range of symbolism the artist intended, we get a much stronger sense of who this woman is and what she is capable of. In William Adolphe Bougereau's 1891 painting, The Broken Pitcher, we see a young prepubescent girl and by her feet is a cracked pitcher, hearkening to the title of the painting. What does it mean? 
You don't need a background in art history to appreciate the mastery of this work, to find it evocative, to appreciate the emotional value of Bougereau's art. But just a little bit of knowledge and the implications of this painting go to very different depths. The cracked pitcher was a familiar trope in Bougereau's historic era, symbolic of taking a young girl's virginity. This painting references the hypersexualization of an underage peasant girl. Wait a minute, are we still talking about tarot? Yes, we are still talking about tarot. Bear with me here, ride out my train of thought. I'm going somewhere with all of this. Here in this painting, we see a sensual woman, most likely celestial in nature, given the way she leans on clouds and the cherubs around her, gazing down lovingly at a nude man. Do you need to know the Greek myth that inspired this painting? Selene, the goddess of the moon, fell in love with Endymion, and more specifically, loved the way he looked when he was asleep. So she asked Zeus to grant Andamayon eternal sleep. That way she could visit every night and admire him. Do you need to know the allegory of the dog? How the Greeks believed the dog symbolized faith and love? Perhaps the emotions of love and admiration are evident to all who study this Bastiano Ricci painting titled Endymion and Selene, and you don't need to know the artist's intent or popular cultural symbolism at that time or history or mythology to derive meaning from this work. But for some of us, that mythological background and the study of art history helps deepen our love and understanding of art. We can be more attuned to the nuances, the undertones, and the subtext. The tarot, especially as tarot is often presented today in the many deck productions availed to us, is 78 works of art. It's art stripping away all of the esoteric, divinatory, or even psychological mumbo-jumbo, a tarot reading is interpretation of art. And just a bit of background knowledge will deepen your appreciation of tarot. What is that background knowledge? It's understanding of the four elements, numerology, astrology, it's hermetic symbolism, and even the intentions of the tarot deck creators, the personal alchemy of science, religion, history, philosophy, and culture that drive your perceptions of tarot symbolism is how you develop wisdom, insight, and how intuition becomes psychic ability. Tarot analytics, then, is how you deepen prophetic technology. Logic does not hinder intuition, not if you're doing it right. Logic unveils intuition.